Wait, 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 wait. Before, before, you, before you do something rash. Listen, I know it's messed up. I, I know you weren't expecting it. But if, if you finish that comment, you're getting canceled. I, I, I wouldn't foul you. I understand where you're coming from, though. To say this when the anime a few months ago physically raised the bar for really just adaptations as a whole. To say this when the current events in the manga are so gripping and hype that my Haitian mother knows that Gojo loses. To say this when even I, a few months ago, revolved my entire education cycle around the weekly release schedule of JJK Season 2. Don't get me wrong, I fucking love Jujutsu Kaisen. It's rare to see a series that evokes such universal hype. It brought the anime community together like Fortnite did with middle schoolers in 2018. It's like Gege Akutami founded his own formula to just create hard moments. He keeps nailing it over and over again. Scenes that just never fail to activate our inner brain inhibitors known as Monkey Man. He's always creating memorable moments. Like this one, or this one, or this one. And you can't forget about that one. But these are just what they are. Moments. When you put all these moments together, does it create for a story? No, not even. Does it account for a generational anomaly that has been consistently topping sales of the most popular manga magazine ever? And something that has made a permanent and drastic effect on pop culture as we know it. Well, you might have assumed it's as the title of the video suggests. That I'd argue, no. But no, I, I'd say yeah. I think it well deserves all of its popularity. So you could delete that draft you've been saving up in the comment section. Okay, at least, at least delete the slurs. The memes, oh my god, the memes, have been nothing but 10 out of 10, 5 star cuisine since season 2. Use it. And the community is honestly like one of the chillest communities ever. So why the fuck am I making this video? Like I I've just been lazing this entire time. Well, as you could have guessed, I'm a terminally online bum. I've been around the internet a lot, but not once have I witnessed an organism with a pulse that whenever JJK is brought up, doesn't immediately change their spawn point to Gege Akutami's dick and start slurping and drooling on that shit. What I'm trying to say is that I recognize all the positives of JJK, but I just don't think it's a 10 out of 10. Or a 9. Or an eight. But of course, we're all subject to our own opinion. Although for mine, I, I do have to whip up some black magic to lightly persuade an entire fan base not to eat me alive. So I pondered where to start. Well, where better than we start? And the start for me was October 3rd, 2020. Season. One. Jusu Kaisen, from my perspective back then, seemed like a much more lackluster version of a series I was obsessed with at the time, Chainsaw Man. But why? I mean, aside from the fact that in both shows the main character gets possessed by a demon and the main trio has an iconic mentor whose powers are beyond comprehension, they really don't have much alike. I think I just defaulted to placing them side by side since they're both new gen shonen with similar DNA. And this comparison led me to putting JJK down a lot, with in my opinion Chainsaw Man having an infinitely superior trio, an inarguably better more interesting all around main character, and an arguably more cooler vibe. But I was wrong, this comparison is dog shit, it'd literally be more correct to compare JJK to Naruto than Chainsaw Man. The only reason I brought it up is for argument's sake in this video, because Chainsaw Man represents why I hated the first episodes of Jujutsu Kaisen so much. Well, hate is a strong word, but what's an even stronger word nowadays is mid. What, what does mid mean to you? What does what does mid mean to you? For me, it's like, have I wasted my time? I'm not sure. That like Jujutsu Kaisen. 
No. <laughs> to me. I personally hate mid shit more than shit shit. The first episodes of JJK released, I watched them and I left those episodes with no thoughts in my mind. The animation was pretty nice to look at, which became the sole factor of keeping it slightly above mid in my opinion. It just seemed like one of those shows that at first wasn't exactly trying to venture outside the box of shonen. And I was kind of a snob about Chainsaw Man and Fire Punch at the time. And if you've ever read or heard or glanced in the direction of either of them, then you know that they are probably the most strange and lobotomizing works ever. Especially Fire Punch. Anyways, I digress. My point is that JJK didn't impress me. I would have called it generic back then. Although now I wouldn't use that word to describe the show. I felt that way since it felt like the same blank slate underdog protagonist where they're fighting demons and they never introduce anything super special or interesting. Keep in mind that it's kind of been a trope for a good while now, even before JJK, that the main character of New Gen Shonen would either merge with or have some sort of fusion dance with the demon or the thing they're fighting in the series. So Sukuna possessing Itadori wouldn't exactly qualify as subversive. So I've been narrating this as my perspective four years ago when the show first dropped. So what's my opinion of it now? Well, it just so happened that I rewatched this season not so long ago. You know, just by total coincidence, not because I wanted to do some video about it or anything. And season one was pretty good. It definitely has rewatchability. Like when Sukuna took Itadori hostage by fucking ripping out his heart and Fushigoro as a last resort was about to spawn in the first Sigma male, Maharaga. Yo, I literally cannot lie. I was giddy. I like stood up and I was like, oh shit, he's actually gonna do it, is he? I literally knew it didn't happen and I was so ready to give my V card up to the goat of goats. I genuinely turned into like one of those power level YouTubers that would make like 30 minute videos on fictional character crossover matchups. I'm, I'm genuinely curious on how you could even talk about this for 26 minutes. Alright, now it's time to definitively answer the age old question that has been debated and argued since the dawn of anime. If Fushigoro in episode 5 of Jujutsu Kaisen were to summon Maharaga, could he defeat Sukuna with only three fingers? Well, according to my calculations, which is calculus for some reason, Sukuna could resist flicker gooning in Maharaga's presence with three fingers. Although, Seven Fingers is a different story. I've made a mistake. Okay, um... Uh, what was it? Was it home again? Oh yeah, uh, season one was enjoyable, but... It seemed void of something. It, I wasn't even sure of what it was upon my rewatch, but I know it was a crucial something in order for a show to evolve. All the greats, the goats, and the classics have it, but it's nowhere to be found in JJK. No matter, we'll probably just find it later in the series. For now though, I'd like to give the show a couple dues that it deserves early on. Itadori is sort of a generic main character. An airheaded, thick skulled idiot who has a strong sense of justice is a description that can almost be applied to every Shonen Jump protagonist, with the, the exception of Denji, of course. Although, I don't think being generic is necessarily a death sentence for a show, or even a bad thing at all. It's how the show handles the character arc of that generic character, which determines if the character is cliched. Itadori is definitely not cliched. They handled his character very well, especially in the arc where Mahito is introduced. Itadori is forced to make some really tough decisions, and he really grows as a character. Another do I want to give this show is the power system, which in this show is Jujutsu or Cursed Energy. It's very interesting, but it's equally as complex. Remember in Hunter x Hunter when the show first introduced an equally complex power system, Nen? They literally spent like two or three full episodes dedicated to exploring this insanely intricate magic. Although in JJK, we get crumbs of information relative to the sheer depth of this power system. To the point where by the end of season one, I personally would not be able to tell you what an innate domain is or domain amplification. And no matter how many times they try to describe a simple domain to me, it just flies over my head. Why the fuck are there so many domains? But at the end of the day, we know enough to at least follow what's going on. So season one is solid. It's not a masterpiece, of course, but it was good enough that it still carries GOAT potential. So now is where it really starts to get interesting. Hidden Inventory, also known as the flashback arc, is the best arc of Jujutsu Kaisen, period. 
it's the best for world building it develops and introduces the best characters and even without itadori or fushiguro or kukasaki hidden inventory captivated me it was the first time i was sold on the world of jjk not because of some cool fight scene or episodic villain but because of a huge shift in presentation like coming straight from season one and going into hidden inventory is trippy i don't know about everyone else but this artsy subtextual character exploration is so dissimilar to the direct power fantasy shown of season one that it feels like we're experiencing works of distinct authors it's hard to fully communicate how this series from season one to two completely diverge from each other but the best way I found to describe it is that Hidden Inventory put a different pair of glasses on when it came to the world of Jujutsu Kaisen. We are given a completely new and refreshing perspective, all through our new main characters, which honestly have such a good dynamic that they absolutely mog Itadori and friends. I wish I could say that Hidden Inventory set the standard for the show, but it's more like a standout as compared to the arcs it's sandwiched between. See, as the arc progresses and things get more real, the arc all of a sudden gets more existential and philosophical. We are given a grim and morbid POV of just about everything going on in the jiu-jitsu world, and for the first time, viewers are inclined to think. All because of one man, Suguru Ghetto. I absolutely fucking love this character. Everything from his character arc and downfall to his morbid philosophy and pessimism to even his powers and character design. All of this culminates into one of the best fight scenes in the show, which is less a battle between cursed techniques and more a clash between worldviews. Okay, I'm sorry, but I sound like a cringy ass English teacher. But seriously, this is one of my favorite scenes in the whole series. Sure, some scenes are objectively more hype or just more pretty to look at, Although, this scene just gave me goosebumps. It verbalizes Ghetto's cognitive dissonance and fucked up state of mind after failing a mission. Then comes the ultimate instigator, Yuki. Usually when your friend is in some bad state of mind and they blurt out some light Yagami type fucked up shit, it's your job to be like, bro, with all respect, you sound like a fucking psychopath. Basically, Yuki starts a conversation and proposes two endgame strategies to Ghetto to eliminate cursed spirits for good. Then, Suguru says something that probably shocked even him when it came out of his mouth. Can we just kill all non-sorcerers though? Yeah, good idea. What? Honestly, that's more efficient than whatever the hell I was talking about. Yuki genuinely be like half responsible for Ghetto's rampage. It's actually kind of funny. Although with his thoughts rearranged and having gained a new perspective, things start to seem all the more simple for Ghetto. Ghetto's arc captivated me. It's very untypical that a shonen like this would even entertain bigger picture ideas, bigger than just killing the ops. I started feeling truly impressed with the quality of JJK villains, with the detestable Mahito to now Ghetto. Ghetto is truly an outstanding JJK character. Ghetto is the missing something that this show needed to be great. Ghetto is the best JJK villain. Is something I really, really wish I could have said. But we are hit with the biggest blue ball in all of anime. The Shibuya Instant arc is phenomenal, conceptually. Gege did a ton of building in season 1, and now he's trying to tear it all down, while also traumatizing the entire fanbase. I honestly wonder if Mappa and Gege fucking coordinated to make it so that every week would leave the fanbase more traumatized than the last, for manga readers and anime onlys. Although while the fanbase was busy having their fourth panic attack, I stood mildly disappointed. The Shibuya Instant arc could have been great. It could have reached the heights of other Go anime arcs, but it was shot in the legs before it even started. Three times. Let's start with the first bullet. 
You know those actions taken by someone that are just simply incomprehensible? You can't even begin to reason with the decision they've made, and to you it's just plain stupid. Why in the world would Gege build up, develop, and give life to this masterclass of a villain, then kill him off? Completely off screen and replace him with a villain we know nothing about. Genuinely the only reason I can think of from the author's perspective is that writing Kenjaku is simply easier than writing Ghetto. Because think of it this way, Kenjaku is just a simpler villain. He's just evil and we don't know what his motive actually is. A motiveless evil villain is easier to write than an idealist who thinks they have a righteous angle. In my opinion, the Kenjaku fumble is the biggest incident of this arc. But what of the rest of the arc? Because we're only actually informed that Kenjaku was the sussy imposter after Gojo was sealed. The arc had some absolutely cold scenes and insane wild shit that I always love, but as a whole, I feel like the Shibuya incident arc is a little bit sloppy. And to explain why, I want to use a case study that I'm sure nobody's ever going to expect as we examine the second bullet. Why don't we take a look at my favorite shonen arc of all time, and a clear inspiration for the Shibuya incident, Hunter Hunter's Chimera Ant arc. These two arcs are similar in the spirit that Shibuya literally spans a couple of hours, and in the twilight of Chimera, it covers mere minutes. And they both utilize a narrator, not because the writers are lazy or anything, it's simply the only way for the audience to follow the events taking place. But there are two big differences between these arcs. One is the placement of it within the story. So if we take Hunter x Hunter, broadly speaking, even though it's still ongoing, I think most people would agree if I were to say its placement is right around here. And for Shibuya, it'd be more like here. So a big hurdle that the arc must get around is the fact that at this point in the story, there are still a ton of characters that have barely been given any time to develop into their own. And on top of that, the arc introduces a boatload of new characters. It seems impossible with this setup to not have flat characters by the end of the arc who would just basically act as fodder to move the plot along or just be completely sidelined. And it becomes even more unlikely when we remember what Gege's intentions actually are for this arc. It's to tear shit down. Characters are going to be dropping like flies. As it turns out, it was impossible. With the only characters to have a satisfying character arc, in my opinion, being Nanami, Itadori, Choso, and maybe Kugasaki, but I was kind of sleeping during a flashback arc. But those are four out of how many characters present in this arc? The Khmer Ant arc also has a boatload of characters but a lot of them are reasonably fleshed out prior to when the arc even kicks into full throttle, and the rest of the characters have like seriously beautiful character arcs during the action. Shibuya either needed more space to breathe before the arc actually took place, or just a longer runtime. In certain places, it felt as though the arc was speedrunning through events just to get to the next fight. The pacing was really off. Increasing the runtime would allow for more of the characters to get fleshed out during the arc. And, you know, placing it further into the show would mean more developed characters prior to the arc actually starting. Now that brings us to the third bullet. What was once a minor critique of season one, now spawns as a major deficit. From season one to two, this problem very noticeably arises because of a shift in how Gege wrote his fights. He switched from a more basic type of fight scene, where powers are showcased and explained, to a very technical style of combat where Gege would assume the readers have a good understanding of the power system and build off of it. Gege assumed the wrong thing. I will bet my money, my entire Steam account, that nobody without looking it up can explain to me what the fuck a domain amplification is. I feel like Gege is one of those people that have these crazy wild ideas floating around in their heads, but when it comes to actually explaining and making sure other people understand the jargon bouncing around his mind, he kind of just half asses it. The general lack of understanding when it comes to cursed energy at this stage really hurts the arc as a whole. And don't get me wrong, I think Gage completely understands his own power system. How else would he build upon that system and flesh it out? For a viewer though, that nice looking building was constructed on top of a flimsy foundation. The worst part is when someone would do some wildly cunning cursed energy maneuver and it just leaves me confused. 
Like, of all reactions, I'm sure Gege would not want the reader to feel confused. It seriously detracts from the experience as a whole. But, at least, that's just me. Maybe I'm special not comprehending this shit, who knows. I just know I'm about to get grilled in the comments by some Jutsu Kaisen PhDs. Well, that's my opinion on the Shibuya incident. It's a little disappointing it was siphoned of all of its potential to be a goat before the arc even started. But hey, I, I still like the arc a lot. I just tend to be more critical on things I like since it was just that much closer to reaching perfection. What I didn't like as much is what comes next. This is where I give anime only their gratitude for tuning in, and also I want to communicate that the crux of my argument, or at least a large part of it, is based off of manga only events. So if you leave feeling unsatisfied, I really don't like this arc. With cursed spirit manipulation and remote idol transfiguration in his possession, Kenjaku now has all the tools to streamline cursed energy, or filter out the weak sorcerers, or you know, whatever the hell this guy is trying to accomplish at this point, I have no idea. Well, I'm sure he'll reveal himself to have some reasonable motive later in the story, but we just gotta wait for that. For now though, post Shibuya. It actually seemed like it could be setting up to something cool and subversive. Itadori and everyone who seeks to unseal Gojo are labeled as criminals and excommunicated from the Jujutsu world, and I think this would have created a nice dilemma for the next arc. Itadori and friends not only have to fight against Kenjaku in hopes to unseal Gojo, but also have to fight against the ones who are supposed to be on their side, the Jujutsu world. But what is the Jujutsu world? The conservative factions that are supposedly making decisions and regulations in the shadows? Or is it perhaps the major Jujutsu families like Zenin or Kamu? It's crazy to think that we know so little about them for how much sheer influence they apparently have. Like, for example, this conservative faction, or the higher-ups of the Jujutsu world, whatever you want to call them, We've never seen the faces of any of them. The only description ever given to them is Gojo at some points calling them old geezers. And the Kyoto president doesn't count since apparently he takes orders from someone else. Then for the families. We've only seen a few notable members from the Zenin clan like Toji, Naobitu, and uh, Maki. But we still don't know the sheer scale of these families and how they operate. Oh, and by the way, speaking of Maki... I have a lot to say about her character arc. So basically, if you don't know, she's lured into the Zenin's clan's base with her father ready to kill her and her twin sister. Then, as her dying gift, Mai grants Maki with all of her cursed energy. As a result, something monstrous was born. Maki, obviously devastated with, you know, her own father trying to end his own lineage, thinks only one thought. Destroy everything. Like a lot of JJK fans, I love Maki's arc. But her arc is actually detrimental to the show as a whole. Let me explain. As established before, I feel like the world of Jujutsu Kaisen is only half-built. There are a ton of factions and families that are said to exist, but we spend no time with them. So fast forward to now where we are introduced to something like 7 named Zenin clan members in half a chapter, and at the end of the half of the chapter, they're all dead by Maki's hands. This is not how you do world building. And actually this is like a brand new thing from uh, the most recent chapter which is uh, chapter 261 by the time I'm writing this script. It's revealed that Gojo just like massacred all the higher ups and this is without us even ever seeing their faces. So now I feel as though this show is in an awkward position where well, the next arc has a lot of work to do. So does it get the job done? Enter the culling games, an event or ritual that brings back sorcerers from the past, awakens new sorcerers and allows current sorcerers into a battle royale type of game that takes place inside of three setup barriers. There are a ton of rules to a calling game that are more confusing than they need to be, but basically once inside the barriers, players have to kill someone within a time frame or risk being killed themselves. Everyone spawns in with a certain amount of points and a player can take another's points by killing them. Then when a player reaches 100 points, they can choose to add a rule to the calling game. This right here is not what this show needs right now. This is the arc before the final arc. 
What this arc needs to do right now is to hone in on the world already introduced and focus on fleshing out the current relevant characters. I could hear a counter argument going something like, well, Hunter Hunter did the exact same thing with Greed Island leading into Chimera Ant, and that is correct. Although the Chimera Ant arc is a massive arc with its runtime being utilized to flesh out a ton of characters. The final arc of Jujutsu Kaisen right now is a single fight. So in essence, Gege is basically throwing in the towel with world building after the Culling Games. And what does the Culling Games actually do? It creates a whole new system of rules the show operates in, introduces a shit ton of new characters that are mostly boring except for Higurama, I like Higurama, and it just hops from fight to fight without leaving any breathing room for the characters to even like talk to each other. Don't get me wrong, the fights in this arc are some of the best in the series, but that doesn't excuse Gege just speedrunning the arc so he could just get to the next big hype thing. I'm actually going to use an example right now from a chapter that has already been adapted, so I'll just use the anime. It's an episode that I'm sure nobody remembers clearly because there are much more captivating episodes in season 2. But this one's interesting because it serves as the border between the hidden inventory and the Shibuya incident. So. It's in this kind of awkward limbo where it's very unclear what to actually put here. But what Gege does is that he just lets his characters have nonchalant interactions with each other, which simply serve to emphasize their personality. And he does this so that the audience can take a breather in between two absolutely insane arcs. It helps with the pacing. But Gege stopped doing stuff like that. Maybe it's because the entire Comedy Relief cast fucking died, but as a result, the show feels more serious. And the seriousness causes the character interactions to barely exist, making me care little for these new characters introduced. The Culling Games introduce so many characters, but we're never given reasons to care a lot for them when they die. I can definitively say that Nobura's death scare was way more shocking and impactful than fucking Kashimo's. You might have noticed that I haven't really talked much about the actual events in the arc, and that's because in my eyes, they don't even matter. With this setup, the writing within the arc could go hard, but in the bigger picture, the culling game still fails at its job. Kenjaku reveals himself to be a bum-ass villain, and the big final boss is actually Tsukuna, not Kenjaku. I'm actually still kind of shocked that they just killed Kenjaku off like that, but I, I didn't want to make it a big point in, in this video since it's like recent enough that Kenjaku could just like get rezzed. Like a certain someone. Jusu Kaisen is no masterpiece. It's great popcorn shonen, but as a critic, I can't give it as much credit as other fans. By the way, to give my personal opinion on the final arc, here we go. It's hype as shit. Look, at the end of the day, this is just entertainment. You don't have to listen to my snobby opinion and enjoy what you want to enjoy. And don't forget to have a nice day. See ya.